If you're someone who struggles with mental illness, you are not alone. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, one in five U.S. adults experience mental illness. And rates are higher for multiracial adults and more than double that for the LGBTQ community. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while now, you've probably heard dozens of our guests and myself talk about our own journeys with our mental health. And I've been really encouraged by the progress that we've seen on a national level, maybe even a global level in the last decade in breaking down the stigma about talking about mental illness and seeking help. Because getting help does, in fact, help. But also, according to NAMI, people wait an average of 11 years to seek help after experiencing symptoms. And that is a long time to suffer when help is possible and is proven effective. Breaking stigma matters, and today's guest has found creative ways to do it. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Harvey. Today's guest is John Mo, someone who can relate to experiencing a long lapse between experiencing symptoms and seeking help. For decades, John lived with undiagnosed depression before seeking treatment, and now he's using his platform to break down the long-standing stigma and shame that prevent people from getting the help they need. John authored a book called The Hilarious World of Depression, And now hosts a podcast called Depresh Mode, which uh, is where he interviews people like Patton Oswalt, Jenny Lawson, about living with depression, anxiety, and other common disorders. He's been working as a writer and radio personality for more than two decades, and he's been hosting nationally distributed public radio programs. And his writing has been published in places like New York Times Magazine, McSweeney's, and the Seattle Times. I spoke with John about how humor can make mental illness less scary, when to know when it's time to seek help, and how we can follow his example in making invisible illness more visible. We also got to talk about how we can move forward from the collective trauma that so many of us are experiencing in the aftermath of COVID-19 and how it affected our mental health. So it's a great conversation. I'm so excited about it. Let's just jump straight into it. I think one of the things that might become pretty clear to listeners pretty quickly is that you have a wonderful radio voice. It's very soothing, enjoyable to listen to, and you've been in radio for a long time. And so I want to just start off by asking, how did you get started in the world of radio and audio? I was an actor for a long time. I I studied Mm. that in college, and then I I kind of played around with it out of college and, and found it to be a bumpy road. And you know, the the more I got away from it, I, I started to write more and more. And the writing led to some editing jobs. And then that led to public radio as a as a writer and editor and producer. And then I kind of found my way to a microphone when no one was looking. <laughs> I've been there ever since. But yeah, I, I was in public radio for 20 odd years. So so the kind of vaguely concerned and pedantic public radio voice comes fairly <laughs> natural to me at this point. It is, yeah, yeah, because it's not the Parks and Rec, Crazy Ira and the Douche radio. It is, right. it is like the NPR Scott <laughs> Simon level stuff. Well, I mean, I when I started, it was the Bob Edwards voice. If mm. people go that far back, and I was considered kind of a, a rebel at first because I just read things out like I would talk to regular people. And a lot of what I do still is I I write out scripts, but it's almost like writing a play for myself. And I'm pretty good at acting the dialogue so it can (laughs) sound like it's off the top of my head. But it's, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure how it works, but it seems to work. So, of course, one of the things that we know about you and listeners just learned about you in the intro is that you've been incredibly open about your mental health journey for a long time now. And I'm curious when you first started to recognize you were experiencing, you know, some experience of mental illness or yeah, when was that first experience for you? Well, I didn't know that it was mental illness. I mean, I had little bouts of dissociation from when I was like five years old, Mm. but then, but then uh, the depression really hit in junior high, you know, puberty age, which happens for a lot of people. And 
I just thought I was going crazy. And all I knew about going crazy was that you didn't know where you were in the world. You didn't know who you were. You got locked up in a padded room in a straitjacket. Like, I think my mental health knowledge came from Bugs Bunny cartoons, largely. And, you know, what I, what I did know was that this is big and horrible, and I better not tell anybody about it ever. I mean, at that age, you want to you want to blend in as much as possible, but it was just it, it was scary, and it had no words as far as I knew. So I just I kept it hidden. I just suppressed it, and you suppress something like that, and it, you can get away with it for a while. You know, like I said, I was I was an actor as a kid, and so I was like, oh yeah, no, I I know how to put on <laughs> performances <laughs> as well balanced person. It's funny now when I talk to people I went to school with. They're like, they're like, but you seem so confident. I was the one who was going crazy. And, and I'm like, you were going crazy, but you were the one that I, <laughs> I was trying to be like. So often what happens with, with my particular brand of depression, it's really stress sensitive. So when I got older, married, bought a house, started having kids, had a career. It was in radio by that point. So, you know, I was in my 30s the stress piled up where I couldn't hide from it anymore. And it just really started to rip me apart. And that's when I went in and got diagnosed. My wife encouraged me to, to go to the doctor. She urged me to go to the doctor and I didn't want to go because I thought, basically I thought I didn't deserve any treatment that other people deserved it more than me. And that's the lie that depression is telling you. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. That I wasn't worthy of it. And that, and that I said, well, and then it's a co-payment, you know, and I got it. <laughs> and our co-payment at the time was 10 bucks. I wouldn't, no. I, I wasn't worth a Hamilton to myself. And then I finally went in and this doctor, you know, very, very quickly said, oh yeah, this is major depressive disorder. And I said, well, I've been feeling this since I was like 11. How long have I had this? And he said, well, I'm guessing since you were 11. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of things we could do. You know, there's, therapy. There's talk therapy. We could look at medication. People, you know, adjust their, their diet and exercise. There's uh, meditation, there's prayer, there's just all sorts of things. They're not all going to work, but some of them, something will probably work if we keep trial and erroring this thing enough. You know, like being told that you've had a chronic mental illness your whole life shouldn't feel good, but it felt so great because I was like, oh, this wasn't personal weakness. This wasn't a moral failing. This wasn't uh, just not being tough enough. This was a, a, an illness. This was diabetes. This was, you know, any any other kind of chronic illness that that you might have. And a lot of things started to turn around. It sounds like for a long time you were able to hide it and either you intentionally told your wife or she just could see it because you were living in the same house. She was seeing you under stress. And then of course you have this conversation with your doctor for the most part. I feel like when people or at least maybe at least true more than a decade ago, there's this gap of time between recognizing your own struggles with mental health and letting others into that, whether it's loved ones or professionals. And so I'm curious during that time, were you letting anybody else into that? And if not, you know, when did you start letting people into that after this conversation with the doctor? Yeah, no, I mean, it was still a, a very personal thing at that point. And I was still kind of tied up in the idea that if I, if I tell people about it, if I'm open about it at all, you know, people are going to be afraid of me. I'm going to miss out on job opportunities. People aren't going to want to socialize with me. And it's that kind of old thinking. But what happened shortly after, a couple of years after my diagnosis is uh, that my older brother, Rick, who taught me to drive, who was my hero, who was everything a big brother uh, you, you'd think of, died by suicide. And uh, the chief reason, he had been in recovery from from a substance addiction for a long time um, that had gone from, you know, marijuana up to pills, up to methamphetamine, but he was in recovery, but the depression got him. He, he thought that he should have been able to fight it off. He thought that, uh, he was weak. He was, he thought that he was shameful to everybody. And the same illness that I had been diagnosed with proved fatal to him. And, 
you know, the, the turning point then was thinking like at his service thinking, okay, if he had talked to a therapist, if he had talked to a, a general practitioner, like a, a doctor, a regular doctor at a clinic, you know, then he might be alive. That moment might have passed, which is what suicide prevention is really all about, getting past that moment. And if people talk more, they have a better chance of staying alive and getting better. Not a guarantee, but a better chance. If people don't talk about it, there's no chance they're going to get better. It's not going to go away on its own. That's not how these things work. It was just a logic thing. Like, well, this is stupid. Like, why would we ever choose silence? And given that intersection in the road, given that fork in the road, why would we take that path? No, let's talk about it more. And still, I was able to go on social media and talk about him more. But it still took a couple of years to, to ramp up. And then finally come out and just say, look, this is me too. This is something that I've been struggling with since before Rick died, before I was diagnosed. This is something that's been going on my whole life. And at the time, I was able to say, I take meds. Uh, I'm not ashamed of them. Initially, my reluctance to go on meds, I asked the doctor, like, I just don't know about meds. He said, oh, really? How's, how's the status quo working out for you? <laughs> I'm like, oh, not so great. He's like, okay, well, maybe try this. And I was able to say, yeah, I, I've got things managed right now. I, I Like, it's still a presence in my life, but I know how to manage it. Just like someone with diabetes can monitor their insulin and, and modify, you know, what goes in and out of their system. You do the same thing and it's okay. And far from people not trusting me, far from getting no opportunities, like it was revelatory. I mean, I've been at this for well over a decade now of talking about it openly and publicly. I've yet to have anyone come forth and say, you shouldn't have talked about that. Mm. But daily I have people saying, thank you for talking about it because your story is in many ways my story too. And I would imagine that's what your fear would have been, that people would be mad at you, tell you that you should not have said that, shame you for saying that. And to have not gotten that in a decade is incredible. And also unsurprising from my perspective. But yeah, when you're inside your head, like it makes sense that you would think that. But I'm glad that you were proven wrong. Well, and and you know, from there it it evolved into talking about it more and then the, the podcasting about it and writing books about it. And as I started to do that, the response was just overwhelming. Like I've been in radio for a while. I've, I've done entertainment shows. I've done technology shows. I've been a business reporter. The response on this stuff was enormous, much greater than anything I'd ever seen with anything else. And I'm like, okay, you know, I, I'm a pretty good writer and talker, but I'm probably about the same as I was before. What this really <laughs> shows is a tremendous hunger. People are just starving to talk about these things and to, and to get out of those you know, closets and, and, and share it in the open. My kind of hunch has always been that we've seen a, a pretty big shift over the last decade in people feeling comfortable talking about mental health, reducing the stigma. In fact, I would, I would love to see some data at some point around that. Cause I'm sure there's been surveys done, but it is really remarkable to see how somebody like you has created a shift in our culture where this is a lot more okay to talk about. And because of that, it, it, it's this beautiful cycle that just continues where somebody talks about it, it helps somebody else realize, oh my gosh, I can talk about it too. And then they talk about it and it's somebody else and it just continues on. So it's a really meaningful thing that you're doing. Well, the the word team comes up in my mind a lot mm. when I'm when I'm writing for the show because there's this sense when you're really suffering that nobody can understand what you're going through. That's what I believe for 20 odd years. Um, that no, if I talk about this, people are going to look at me funny, but in my experience, it's been just the opposite. And like, I've, I've been thinking about as a sort of donation, thank you gift for the show of like trying to make little bells that people can have. And so that whenever somebody says something in the show that resonates with them, they could just ring a little bell. <laughs> I thought that might be kind of fun. What I'm doing right now is all about finding stories to tell, whether it's about a topic like um, the post COVID trauma that we're all about to hit, or if it's uh, workplace burnout, 
or if it's an interview with you know, Patton Oswald or somebody, somebody's going to say something and you're going to say, oh, that's me as well. And then instantly you're, you have help. You know, you're part of a team, you're part of a crew and it's a human instinct to want to belong to things, you know, whether it's, whether it's a, a workplace or a team or, you know, an orchestra, whatever it is, like you want to be part of, of something greater than yourself. And that's what I'm trying to build with mental health. I love that. I think that's such a great way of thinking about it. And I want to talk about your new podcast, Depression Mode. It is so good. First, again, I just love your voice. I love your thoughtful approach to mental health. Also, I just loved that episode with Patton Oswalt. I'm halfway through the burnout episode, so don't don't spoil the ending if there's a spoiler, <laughs> but it's been really helpful already. And yeah, it's the kind of thing where as I'm listening, I'm like, oh, I, I resonate with that. I relate to that. And it feels great to hear somebody else talking about it because you do a really good job of talking about things in a very like, friendly conversational way too, where it doesn't, I could probably read data around something. I could read, you know, some studies or something. I could read some boring article, but hearing a person talk about it like a human is super helpful. And tell me a little bit more about your goals when you decided to create depression mode. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to create a space where people can recognize things and, and feel recognized themselves and to make it not so terrifying because it is, I mean, <laughs> having something going on in your head can be really scary because it's not like a broken arm. It doesn't show up on an x-ray and it's, you know, a lot of that fear and anxiety is, has contributed to so much of what we call the stigma around it, you know, that, that we don't talk about it because it's, we don't know what it's doing. We don't know how it got there and where it's going to go. And so I, I think if you can make a joke in the midst of that, you take away the power of the scary thing. I grew up as I, I wasn't the biggest kid or the strongest kid, but I could, I talked my way out of a few bullyings just by, <laughs> by making some jokes and by, by, you know, kind of striking up the conversation. And I think if we can talk openly about it and make a few jokes, then it, it gets less scary. I mean, I think about, my dad used to tell these hilarious stories about him and his friends growing up. And he grew up during the Nazi occupation of Norway. He grew up with soldiers on the streets and people being dragged out of their homes they never seen again. But he had really funny stories. Those stories, those, you know, human experiences with people who he loved, that got him through it, that let him survive a lot of that stuff. And, you know, you hear soldiers tell tell stories. You hear, you know, whatever, law students tell these stories of like when things were really rough. And and so I think that's that's what I'm kind of trying to go for. And and I could, you know, way back when I was starting this, I thought, well, I would love to know the chemistry of what depression does in the brain. Turns out we don't know all that much. But like I'd like to know a lot of the clinical stuff because I find the topic really interesting. But I think it's more useful to hear the human experiences. And I think people were, would be more likely to download it if Pat Oswalt's name was on it, <laughs> um, you know, or Jenny Lawson or some of these other people who I, I have on, like you want to hear from those people. I compare it to when my kids were young and they had an ear infection and they wouldn't tolerate the, the medicine, the antibiotics straight up. So I'd mix it in with a little bit of strawberry ice cream and they'd love it. And so the comedy, uh, the humanity is the strawberry ice cream. And then the, the mental health knowledge is the antibiotic. I call that um, bait and switch for good. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and we do that here where uh, we've got a, a print newspaper filled with good news. And it's called uh -huh. the good newspaper. And the thing about it is that our goal is never that somebody just leaves it feeling a little bit better and then sits on their couch. Our goal is always that people are motivated to take action, join in, and create more good news in the world. But if we called it like the homework newspaper, like nobody would <laughs> right. nobody would buy that. And Your so, new life mission. <laughs> exactly. And so it's and and of course, you know, we're outing ourselves on the show because people ultimately want both, but you do need to sweeten the deal a little bit up front. And that's, what's great is, you know, I download Patton Oswalt first because I 
like his stand up specials. But mm-hmm. I'm then going to, you know, listen to all of the next layer stuff because it's what I'm craving at my core. And you, I think you're delivering both, which is amazing. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's certainly the goal. We are taking a quick break. And when we come back, John is sharing how to know when it's time to seek help and also how we can all collectively move forward and support one another in the aftermath of how COVID-19 affected our mental health. We'll be right back. Sounds Good is sponsored by BetterHelp. Right now, I think we all know this, we are going through a collective global trauma. If you've been struggling with your mental health, that is so normal. So many people are experiencing that same thing. And on top of the collective global trauma that we're experiencing, we're all working through interpersonal relationships and life struggles. You probably need someone to talk to. I know that I do. BetterHelp is an amazing solution for this. BetterHelp makes it easy to get matched with your own licensed professional therapist. Plus, it's affordable. All you have to do is answer a few questions and they'll get you matched and ready to start in under 48 hours. I've been using BetterHelp for a while now. It started in the beginning of the pandemic where I just wanted to be able to talk to somebody. And so I would take video calls or like voice calls from my neighborhood. I would walk around my neighborhood and I would talk with a therapist and it was so helpful for me. And now I'm fully vaccinated. I am ready to go back out into the world. And it's so nice to not be tethered to my hometown if I want to talk to my therapist. I can hop on a call when I'm traveling. I can hop on a call when I'm busy. And it just gives me great access to my amazing therapist whenever I want. BetterHelp is offering a special offer for Sounds Good listeners where you can get 10% off your first month when you take the quiz to get started at betterhelp.com slash good. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash good. One more time, that is betterhelp.com slash good. Sounds Good is sponsored by Libro FM. Libro FM, and if you've been listening to the podcast for a while now, you already know this, They're the company that lets you support a local bookstore every time you download an audiobook. And (laughs) I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but they are almost identical to the major audiobook company that you hear advertised in other podcasts. It's the same price. They have the same books. The app is amazing. The only real difference, in my opinion, is that (laughs) one supports a giant mega corporation and the other supports a local bookstore of your choosing. You get to keep money within your local economy, you create local jobs, and you make a difference in your community. If you are using that giant audiobook company, you should make the switch to Libro FM. And if you are not yet, but you're like, oh my goodness, I want to start listening to audiobooks and support my local bookstores in the process. Well, the good news is that there is a special offer for Sounds Good listeners. Libro FM is offering two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership when you use the code GOOD. All you have to do is visit the website Libro.fm, that's L-I-B-R-O dot F-M, and use the promo code GOOD to get started with two audiobooks to make a difference in your local community and to help support this show. I think that you're delivering this show at a really important time. You recently shared on Twitter, and I verified it with the U.S. Census Bureau, that there's this stat that just came out that 42% of people surveyed by the U.S. Census Bureau in December reported symptoms of anxiety or depression in December, which is an increase of 11% from the previous year. And that's a big number. And I do want to couple that with the incredibly good news that suicide rates in 2020 actually defied expectations by decreasing during the year, thanks to greater access to mental health resources, decreased stigma, and more of us kind of being in the same boat together. But the reality is we're probably up against a challenging 
next year, next few years, as more people deal with potentially the ramifications of the pandemic and I'm sure a myriad of other things. And so what do you think that we need to be mindful of over the next year and coming years as more and more people are reporting and experiencing symptoms for anxiety or depression or other mental illnesses? I think it's important to pay attention to history because it's it's a roadmap for the future. We know that the trauma of 9-11 stayed with people, especially people in New York and D.C., for many, many years after. That's measurable. We know that around the world on all uh, – all epidemics from from SARS to MERS to to Ebola, we know that suicide rates climb every time. And we know that there is a shortage of mental health resources. We know that that it's very, very difficult to get in to see someone. Um, And those numbers are increasing, but they're not increasing across the board. They're not increasing among people of color. They're not increasing. There's, you know, not an additional wave of trans therapists coming out. So resources are going to be super tight. And we, we know that what we're going through, it really depends on whether or not you're capitalizing the word trauma. Right. So I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I just am someone who has a lot of conversations. <laughs> and, and from what I have gathered, you know, if you, if you have lost somebody in COVID, obviously that's trauma. There's a number called the, the bereavement multiplier, which is nine. So for every person who dies, there are nine people close to them who will be impacted with bereavement. You know, and so you multiply 600,000 times nine and, and the numbers start getting pretty high. And that's before secondary trauma. That's before, you know, friends and coworkers. That's just direct family. And so we know something is coming our way. We also know that we can't really begin to process a thing until the thing itself is done. I've had the, uh, the misfortune to be in a, a few dangerous car accidents in my life. And during them, I always would have a sense of calm of like, okay, let's see who's hurt. Let's see if we can get out. Let's see what, what's going on. And then only afterwards, when I'm you know far away from it, do I have a complete breakdown. And so we, you know, there are still people dying every day of COVID and there are issues around COVID. And so we know something's coming our way and we can be, we can secure whatever mental health resources we can for ourselves. We can give ourselves and other people time to heal uh, because we do have this knowledge that I think in a lot of other pandemics and, and crises, uh, people might not have had as much. So we've got that really going for us. And it, we can be ready in in that sense. I know that, like, I don't know if you've had this experience. Everybody I know has, that I've asked about it. You're watching a movie or TV show. Uh, it was filmed a long time ago. There's a crowd scene. Everybody's packed together and yelling <laughs> about something. And you're like, put on a mask. Oh, and, yes, truly. And you know that it was filmed a long time ago. You know that it's irrational that you think that way. But you think that way anyway. That's going to be with us for a while. And we've all just got to give each other a break and, and let ourselves and each other just say, yeah, okay, that's okay to feel that way. You, you know, it, you're on a journey. And, like, don't expect to be to bounce back completely, you know, like on the day that they declare that it's under control. And so that kindness to ourselves and others, I think is probably our, our biggest tool to use, our most valuable tool to use. I heard somebody say recently that right now, everybody needs more than anybody can give to yes. them. Yeah. And I feel that deeply. And I think it's why, you know, if you've dealt with any conflict in the last year, it's felt heightened because nobody has the capacity to give as much grace as people require. And the great thing is, I do think that as you know, I, I know you just got your second dose uh, of the vaccine. I get my second dose next week. We're both Pfizer gang, by the way. Yep. Um, yep. It's <laughs> the new astrology for Pfizer. I, truly, it's the stupidest <laughs> thing, but I love it. And you know, now I'm going to get to 
you know, fill my bucket a little bit. I'm going to get to spend more time in the sunshine. My wife and I finally planned a trip where we're going to road trip somewhere. And it feels like maybe I'm going to have a little bit more energy. And if I can be intentional about giving that back out to people and showing a little bit of extra grace, I think that maybe the universe will reciprocate and we'll all be able to do that to some degree. You got to have that faith. Like if, if you don't have hope for the future, I'm a big believer in, in finding hope. And if it doesn't present itself immediately, I'm a believer in going to look for it, yes. <laughs> you know, knocking on doors and hunting it down and, and spending conscious effort because it's valuable. You know, I will say too, that as we, as we come out of this, Something that I didn't know until I was ways into covering this topic was the definition of a disorder. Like, okay, you have anxiety, but do you have an anxiety disorder? Like, you know, what is the the threshold for declaring that? And it's surprisingly simple. If it's interfering with the daily function of your life, you know, like there's an emotion, but like if it's getting in the way of you keeping yourself clean, getting to work on time, putting food on the table for the people you need to put food on the table for, then that's not a failing, that's a disorder. And it's more than you could probably handle. That's the time definitely to seek out help. I was doing a, an event the other day and somebody said, well, how can I fix myself uh, after experiencing a trauma disorder and I'm having panic disorder, I'm having PTSD, what can I do about it? And I'm like, that's like saying that there are sparks shooting out of your electrical outlets. Don't do the electrical work yourself. You're going to get hurt. <laughs> Call an electrician. You know, like if your faucet is dripping, try to fix that yourself. If there's water gushing everywhere, please call a plumber or you're going to make things worse if you try to do it on your own. So if the disorder is happening, by all means, try to track somebody down to help you with it because it's not your fault and it can be better than it is. It's easier than it feels in the moment. Yes. Yeah, you don't want to do that work yourself. But if you can reach out and find a guide, which, you know, I think the easiest thing is just to call your doctor and then be like, I need this guide. And then they're like, oh, I can refer you or I can be that person. But the other thing is talk to a friend, a partner, somebody who can help you with that too. Because that's the other thing about depression especially is it zaps that energy of being able to take that action sometimes. And so somebody else if they can be gracious enough to help do that for you, I, I'm sure there's somebody in your life who would like to do that. It's a little bit the opposite of a more traditional physical injury. If you mm. break your leg, there's extreme pain and maybe a shard of bone poking out to tell you to go get it fixed. Depression covers its tracks. Depression makes you think it's it's your fault. It makes you less likely to seek the help that you need. So, you know, don't let it get away with it. As one final question, as we wrap up this conversation, I think you've done this incredible job of publicly modeling an approach to making invisible mental illnesses visible again by talking about them, acknowledging them publicly, and also just laughing about them. Not everybody has a radio show. How would you encourage listeners to follow your example in their everyday lives? And what kind of results might they expect just from the act of making the invisible visible. I'm a big advocate of reaching out to people and indicating that the door is open. Mm. I don't think you can go to somebody and say, what are your mental problems? <laughs> and, and have them really open up. But, you know, even just like, hey, I know to, you know, saying to your your relative, your friend, your neighbor, I know that the numbers are are scary right now. I know mm. people are going through a lot of stress. There's a lot of depression, anxiety. How are you doing? And there's a very good chance that they'll say fine and walk swiftly away. And that's okay if they do, because then they know that the door is open. When they are ready to talk, they'll come back with that. But And more than likely, some form of answer will happen. And then that channel is open. Then that subject is no longer off limits. I happen to work in a big network. I've got a big network of people who listen to me and, and who I'm in touch with. It's part of my job. But, you know, everybody's got some sort of network that they function in. So, you know, throw out a flag on that and just say, hey, this door is open. This channel's open. And when you're ready, let's talk about it.
That's John Moe, host of the podcast Depression Mode and the author of the book, The Hilarious World of Depression. You can listen to Depression Mode wherever you are listening to this podcast right now. And you can buy his book wherever you buy books. We've got a link in the show notes. I also highly recommend following John on Twitter at John Mo. This podcast was created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. You can find more good news and ways to make a difference in our weekly email newsletter, our beautiful print good newspaper, or online at goodgoodgood.co. This episode was created by Kaylee Thompson, Megan Burns, and me, Brandon Harvey. It was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. If you want to help support the show, make sure to hit the follow button wherever you listen to podcasts and then do us one more solid and leave a rating. That helps more people find the show and find our good news and good action. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and share your story and we'll be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good?